Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Alec Kouros to you. And I'd like to tell you, I'll tell you first what he does, but then I'll tell you a little bit about him, who he is as a person. Uh, he's an associate professor of educational technology and media, and he's the coordinator of information and communication technology at the Faculty of Education at the University of Regina. And he works with undergrads and with graduate students to develop their understanding and their competencies in working with technology and with media in the K-12 environments. So he's worked in both K-12 and post-secondary. He's given hundreds of workshops and presentations nationally and internationally on topics such as what he's talking about today, open education, social, networked, connected learning, instructional design, digital liter uh, citizenship, and critical media literacy. But now, more about his, who he is. His, he has a philosophical approach to learning and sharing and knowledge building. And that approach is one of collaboration and openness. And he's an educator who walks the walk, who leads by the work that he does, um, and distributes what he's learning with all of his networks. He recently submitted an open CV for his tenured promotion file. So instead of the stack of binders that we would normally submit for tenure and promotion, he had it online. It was open for all to view. And it was successful, too. Yay. <laughs> he uh, shares his emergent thinking in his popular educational blog, Open Thinking. Alec uses his networks to explore his educators. For instance, one of the things that a lot of people who use Ning are really concerned about now is that little line that's going across saying, we're starting to charge you in July. And uh, he sent out an invitation for comments and soon had a whole document from educators all over the world talking about Ning and charging and that whole lack of openness. So Alec is engaging. He's passionate and enthusiastic in what he does. He also has an 11-year-old, 11-day-old new addition to his family named Sophia, his third child. Yes. <laughs> so Alex's here to share some of his energy and commitment with us. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Alec Kouros. How's that? Perfect. Sound level's good? No. Thanks again. It, I've, I've been on a panel with George before, um, but I've never followed him, and uh, <laughs> this is going to be very interesting. As I was mentioning to Martha, my approach to this topic, it comes very much from a practitioner. As a, as a faculty member, it's uh, very personal, very practical, very pedagogical, and, and, and a bit uh, philosophical, certainly. Um, I'm going to start with who I am. and, and very much of what I do is around digital identity. So, and I believe that very strongly that faculty members um, can project their digital identity to be very successful in one of those things that we do. And as Martha mentioned uh, earlier, putting out my open CV, one of the things that was really neat about that is uh, a professor from Virginia Commonwealth University um, created a document that said, um, you know, how, uh, he actually created a uh, sort of a survey that said, what have you learned from Dr. Alacoros? And people from all over the world kind of, you know, put in little testimonials and that sort of thing, which I think was really kind of useful in a number of ways for, for my document going further and for me being successful in this. Um, what do we got here? Okay, anyway, my family there. Um, uh, obviously, I, I, as Martha was mentioning, uh, I do present quite a bit. I, I find myself as a, as a full-time learner and a lifelong learner, certainly, and I like to take a lot of risks. I really try to inspire taking risks. Even if it was just jumping off my couch, this is a, a photograph my four-year-old took uh, at the time, and uh, she, I trusted her with my really nice DSLR, <laughs> which was really probably not a great thing, which was taking risks in another way, but this is also jumping off, a, uh, jumping off the couch there. Oh, and how did that get in there? I'm not even sure how that got, oh, well, that's my 11-day-old, uh, so we, yeah, sorry. So my new pride and joy, which I feel like I've missed half her life already because I've been on the road, which is a little bit sad. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the shift. And I'm probably going to spend a little bit of time over here just to make sure that I've got this. 
Um, oh, and then my girl got in there. I told you this is going to be very personal, right? Um, this is my girl about three weeks ago learning how to use iMovie. She's five years old. Um, this is the same skill that I taught my undergrads using to use probably, well, two months ago in the middle of the semester. And it's really neat. All she's done is watch me. She, she watches me prepare for presentations. This, to me, is kind of a new learner here. Uh, my boy here, uh, I think this quote is kind of neat. <laughs> this is just an example of, if you haven't noticed already, this is just like actually an excuse to show family pictures the entire time. All right. <laughs> The current generation of college student has no memory of the historical moment before the advent of the internet. We still talk about pre-internet and post-internet, and I think that's kind of an interesting to think that when my kids grow up, this is going to be just something that's always been, that we've always been connected, that we've always had broadband, we've always had this abundant access to information, and that, I think, we don't have to talk about digital natives, digital immigrants, and that sort of thing. We just have to understand uh, people who are connected in these different ways, and that makes a huge difference. Um, I'll talk a little bit, I'll get a little bit more academic, not nearly as academic as, as George there, uh, knowing his stuff incredibly well. But Dave Wiley is someone who's uh, very prominent in the open education movement. He actually coined the term open content. Uh, he kind of talks about this shift in reality. He talks about uh, then versus now and the, and the key terms, and I think these are fairly easy to understand, analog to digital. Obviously, digital brings a whole new realm uh, especially around scalability, uh, copyability, et cetera. Uh, from tethered to mobile, I think recent reports are looking at we will exceed the number of desktop connections to mobile connections. So there will be more mobile connections by around 2013, 2014, accessing the Internet worldwide. So that's a huge shift in terms of mobile. And I think there was a good question around laptop learning, one-to-one -one learning. I'd probably be pushed that sort of thing uh, a bit further, perhaps not, as George said, in kindergarten uh, in that range, but there are certainly elementary students that could uh, benefit from one-to-one uh, -one connectedness or one-to-four connectedness. Isolated versus connected, it's something I'm going to talk about a bit more. The, the one big thing I think is that I'll, I'll speak about a lot is the idea of the personal, which George touched, touched on quite a bit. And how do we actually personalize education? So that whole idea that we personalize learning, that the same type of learning activity that happens with every single student, this is something we've known for years, but for the first time with the, the number of enablers that we have today, we can really personalize it in a different way. Consumption versus creating, obviously the tools that we've created, we've created more of a, creations, uh, a creation economy uh, or, or the ability to create with the tools that we have. You can just look at YouTube to see well, it's not always creativity if you see this cat in, on an iPad or whatever else, but there's some really interesting. And this whole shift from closed to open, which is really important to my work. So if you look at the kind of the top little thing there, Wiley kind of plays on this, basically then versus now and education versus every day. And we've already talked about the doomsayers. I think George was a bit of a, you know, kind of negative in a lot of senses, like in a real, in a real way that we are certainly lacking behind in many ways in education in terms of looking at these particular changes. Um, Wiley and Mott, in a, in a recent paper, also talk about how we deal with community and those sorts of things in uh, education. So he actually, uh, Mott was the first author, he looked at the idea of the personal learning network, which is something that you may not have heard of, but it, it's a, a personal learning network is something that you can do outside of your courses. It's something that you develop outside of your courses. It's, it's prolonged, it's sustained, and there's some emerging uh, literature around this versus the CMS, the course management system. What we tend to do typically is the idea of creating community. We really try to create community. We use the term community all the time in our pedagogy, but what we end up doing is sort of this idea of sort of building community and then making everyone erase it and then creating another course and building community and making everyone erase it. I think uh, Wiley and Mott taught, used the kind of the, the parallel, what if you took Facebook and just told everyone that they have to erase all their contacts, everything, every four months, you know, just totally destroying everything and then starting from scratch all the time, which is really, you know, against the whole idea of building a long-term community in what we're doing. Um, also, the idea of social affordance, which is, I think, another term that George mentioned as well. Um, you, depending on the tools we use, what sort of openness or what sort of affordances do we have there? Uh, I've used abundant, abundance of tools. Obviously, the more closed tools, Blackboard, to some extent, Moodle is a bit more closed, but there's, a, a, there's still a real need for privacy, uh, privacy within learning and so on. 
But if you get into things like WordPress, they could be owned by students, they could be controlled by students, they can take learning documents that become portfolios, and I'll, I'll kind of continue on that particular note. Uh, Ning, for instance, is another type of learning environment which now is starting to charge, but it's a quite effective learning environment because it's Facebook-esque. It allows you to create social network, and it's something that I've used in the past with a lot of success, and things like Wikispaces. These are all types of tools that can become uh, learning environments. Some of them are controlled by the institution, some of them not so much. Uh, I like George's ideas that um, that sort of center of innovation where you can come to your institution and say, I'd like to try this and it's ready, you know, it'll be ready this afternoon, th those sorts of things. I don't know if we're preparing our institutions for that, but I think it's incredibly important. Uh, David Weinberger talks uh, uh, in the Clue Train Manifesto, he talks about uh, the web is as a pure connection, free of the arbitrary constraints of matter, distance, and time. And this is very different than the university in a lot of ways. And so when we start to see the launch of, of personal learning, it becomes a whole different thing. And the constraints that we have within our institutions really in a number of ways. Um, this is sort of a call or a question from Educause. How can we begin to move past an educational model that is tethered to time and place and move closer to learning that is immersive? And just say those words to yourself. Immersive, mobile, collaborative, and social. And I think those are really important trends in looking at how we can personalize learning. So I'm going to talk about this whole idea of personalization and, hope, hope, and hopefully by giving my own sort of examples of this, you can sort of pour, look at your own examples and see why this is important as a learner. Um, one of the other trends and one of the things I've been trying a lot um, this is something I developed, just sort of a, an idea, a metaphor in my mind, something that I was able to put on paper, um, or, or paper, or I guess digital paper, or a screen, I guess. I, I don't actually ever use paper. Um, I should, should perhaps. Um, this whole idea of how do we take a digital citizen? So I work a lot with K-12 students. I, I work a lot with teachers. That's my primary role. And I think one of the things that we have to understand is how do we take what is a very closed set of uh, structures, a closed set of procedures, practice, et cetera, and move it to the open. Very much like when your daughter is 13 years old and decides to open up that Hotmail account and perhaps doesn't make the right choice. I get all of these undergraduate students that have email addresses like sexy14 at hotmail.com, and they, they, they continue with those sort of things towards... Uh, you know, a professional portfolio, it, portfolio. It's right on their portfolio, or they send it to the prof, and we know there's an issue. But at 14 or at 13 or 12, when you're breaking the terms of service, you don't have a sense of what that means or what that may mean in the future. But there needs to be within the K-12 system, certainly, and certainly by the time that students enter the, 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 the university, uh, if that is the structure that will be in uh, 20 years or, or 10 years from now, that there needs to be this understanding, the addressing of the digital citizenship or digital identity of students. Um, so helping students understand private versus public education, embracing more informal learning in our, in our teaching, in our university, and also understanding what it means to be closed, what it means to be open, and where this makes sense. Um, also looking at the whole idea of new metaphors, this is just one I threw out. There's, there's hundreds of different metaphors we can look at. This is the idea of the network Sherpa. Um, I do believe that um, faculty members need to be much more media literate. I don't care if it means looking at YouTube videos all day, but getting a sense of what kids are doing needs to be part of what we do in a lot of ways. Not just the content itself, but what it actually does to our kids in that sense. Also the idea of social networks, to participate in social networks uh, for personal reasons sometimes, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or those sorts of things, will lead us to places where we can also use these things in professional networks. I believe that has been very, very key for uh, many of the teachers I work with. And certainly, uh, and, and George in, in his book and his whole, whole constructs around connectivism, the way that knowledge is changing uh, in this society is, is quite key to this. So I'll talk a little bit about the enablers, and George talked about a lot of these throughout but I think these are some of the key enablers. Uh, certainly the, the plethora of free tools that we have available to us. This is just a screenshot of the tools that I use almost every day. There's perhaps a couple that I use every single day. Um, I don't know how many of those you use. I'm not saying these are 
uh, the ones we should use. Most of these are not supported by the institution. But these, as a, as a researcher, as a scholar, as a practitioner, these are the ones that I use almost single day. Whether it's WordPress for my blog, Flickr to upload photos, uh, Skype to communicate with colleagues across the world, uh, Facebook I even use, mostly for personal reasons, but at least I'm connecting in a number of ways. It's, it's the place I can have conversations with um, that person I taught you know, 15 years ago in a school uh, with a faculty member, with the president of my institution, with uh, all of these different things, all in the same breath in some cases, which is really weird because we have this whole sense of these, uh, what Dana Boyd would call collapsed context, where we're speaking to everyone within the same, uh, in the same space. But all of these tools make a huge impact on what we can do. And understanding what, you know, the enablers, the affordances of these tools makes a big difference in our practice, or could. Uh, looking at one specific area itself, the idea of digital storytelling. This is Alan Levine. Uh, he, he's known on the web by Cog Dog. Um, really interesting fellow. He, he kind of went out and decided to take the idea of digital storytelling. So if I'm going to take one story, let's see how many tools will enable me to tell that story. Uh, so he's, he's, he, his initial idea was to take 50 tools. And he ended up with like 80 or 90 or, you know, a huge list of tools. So we have all these tools for the single ability to tell stories with, yet we continue just to do nothing but essays and expressing our stories. We are a storied culture, but this is, these are these huge, uh, very impressive tools that are available to us, and we can have our students tell stories in different ways. And that's just one set of them. Uh, this I really like. This is probably a month old or so. Um, this is a, a guy by the name of Eric Whitaker. Uh, if you Google him, he's a composer. And what he did was basically put out a YouTube video. It was sort of a track that you could sing with. So he uh, put out the score of some music. He auditioned kind of singers and so on. And he put out this particular track where people could synchronize and sing into their webcam. So you see this. Is it going? In a second. I won't show you the whole clip, but. We have audio, I'm not sure. Okay. All right, so people are looking at their webcams at this person, and they're singing along. And so what he was able to do, I think there was 108 voices, 108 people who submitted their videos to this person, including the person who uh, he auditioned for the lead, and he creates this, which hopefully should work. There we go, all right? So he was, you know, through digital video editing, brings all of these people together which is really kind of neat and impressive, and actually it's much more than that. It's like wild. It really is, if you think about what we can do with the tools, with everyone submitting. And I think this is a really cool metaphor for what we can do when we collaborate and we use the affordances of these tools. This is something that I think is just absolutely wonderful. If you watch it, they actually have the story of how this was done. But how do we do this in education? How do we take these individual voices and we bring these together in this way? which I think is quite, quite amazing. All right, so I sort of cut that off. It's quite, <laughs> I should have just sort of, you know, I could have really gone with that. Um, Real-time collaboration. So uh, when we're thinking about collab collaboration, typically at the institution, we're not thinking about these very beautiful ways, but they can be beautiful even in very textual ways. As Martha was mentoring, uh, mentioning before, um, there was a, Ning, again, is a social network. And now they've decided as a company they're going to start charging. Educators like these things free, obviously. And it's actually only about $2.95 a month or something. I'm not, I'm representative from Ning. But, you know, people got quite upset that they were charging at all because sometimes you don't even have that budget, uh, especially K-12 educators. Um, so, but a lot of people were grumbling about this. And so I put out a single tweet. So, you know, there's, there's a number of people who follow me on Twitter, but there's a number of people, of these people who follow me, they're just not people who care about, you know, ham sandwiches and all those other things that we often associate with Twitter. They're people that are practitioners who have real problems, who are, um, I mean, real problems around education, who are administrators, etc. people who want to spend some time solving these problems. Now, it's difficult in my institution, not particularly my institution, but our institutions as, as general, to solve problems uh, even at a, you know, an academic staff meeting, for instance. It's difficult to get people together all at the same time. Um, but to do this with almost totally str total strangers to solve problems, and this is sort of what it looked like. 
So there's Google Docs real time, which allows you, with a number of other people, to start solving problems together, which is really kind of cool. Real time collaboration, seeing the ideas of others transpire in the front of, in front of you, and keeping track of all that stuff. It's almost as beautiful as that musical thing. <laughs> I mean, to me it is. To see ideas formed, to see ideas negated, to see ideas expand, it's almost as beautiful as what we just saw, just without the music. Maybe if you just run some beautiful Mozart in the background or something, it would be almost as beautiful. The act of creation is a beautiful thing. And I think when you have a number of people doing that, that's just incredible. So another, you know, yes, yesterday I, I did the keynote at, or one of the keynotes at CNIE, and so at the beginning of it, I got my, uh, my presentation actually auto-tweets. So when I hit a particular slide, it actually auto-tweeted something. So I didn't have to type it in. So, you know, because it's so hard to type in 140 characters. But when you're in the middle of a presentation, um, you want to do that. And then to think about, see if I've actually got my internet connection still. Or maybe not. Uh, I can't show you the, the map, but I think there were about 50 people. Basically, I put out a survey. Uh, at the, at the very beginning, beginning of my presentation, at the end, like it went to er people around the world, and 50 people actually filled up this r rather long survey about the favorite tools they could use, why social media is important ed in education, and so we had this resource while, you know, during this presentation, people filled this out, which was really kind of neat. And you could do this with a well-developed personal learning network. Remember that term I used earlier. Um, so that was the first enabler, the free tools. Uh, and certainly, that they work best with networks. Uh, the big other one, the other, one of the other big tools is the idea of free and open content. And you may have heard this uh, term. You may have heard it as open content. You may have heard open educational resources. Um, this was probably made very large, or uh, I, MIT wasn't the first uh, university that did this, but it was the first university that, big university that was big enough to make this sort of a real thing, that's something that actually people noticed, and so on. So if you look at the MIT Open Courseware Project, most of you probably have heard of it before, you can look at all this content, full courses, totally available, totally free, et cetera. So a number of a big Ivy League uh, universities have followed suit. If you go to Stanford on iTunes, you can see, listen to full lectures. We've come to the point where content, there's so much content out there that becomes, let's just give it away. I think Charles Vest at Duke University, uh, sorry, at MIT, when he was the president when this actually happened, he said, the content is not what's important. It's the, the relationships we have in our residential experience. It was really important at that time to talk about relationships versus the content at our universities, which I think was kind of neat at the time. But of course, there's other ones, OER Commons, Connections, et cetera, a lot of places where you can get this free content. Of course, the open web is the biggest one, Googling something and finding something that's copy left. Amazing resource, obviously. Um, if you go to Creative Commons, um, that's a place where you'd find this copyleft uh, information, all of this free content, whether it's images or videos, uh, archive.org, for instance, if you want to go to public domain videos, which I use all the time. But this abundance of, of content is available at our fingertips, and it's stuff that we can use in our presentations. There's no royalties, nothing we have to worry about in this sense. And just by going to search.creativecons.org, I told you this is going to be a bit practical, right? Um, but it's not even that. It's not even the, you know, the educators that are putting this stuff in. It's things like the Khan Academy. Uh, for a K-12 resource, this, this is the Khan Academy. I'll explain this. This person named Salman Khan, uh, who decided basically he was, I think he was helping his niece. Actually, he'll tell the story right away. But it came down to he just started creating some screencasts, some tutorials for his niece. And it grew and it grew and grew and he created more and more of these videos. And soon he had like over 1,000 videos. I think it says something like 1,200 plus videos. This is one person creating this much content and he's created this institute around him and I'll let him tell his story here. Just 
one thing that kind of shocked me, I got a lot of letters from the Middle East, I got a lot of letters from Latin America, Ethiopia, Uganda. It's really uh, reached far more uh, students than I could ever imagine. Right now, there are about a thousand videos. I started recording about three years ago. Uh, now I'm doing it full time. I'm hoping to be able to put out a couple hundred videos a year. I, I see a world where literally anyone with access to a computer and the internet will be able to go to the Khan Academy and get a world class education. It will be the world's free virtual school. The idea of the free virtual school is not something new, and it's not, he's not the only one doing this sort of thing to, to have access to free education. But if people off the internet are creating this content, then when we create content, what are we doing? What, what should we be doing different? And it's not just you know, this person who ha is very well educated, who has an MBA, but it's, um, oh, here, I'll go to actually I'll get, come back to that one. Those are a bit out of order. It's this, these kids. So I wanted to teach something called Scratch to my kids. It's a, it's a, 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 a kind of a, uh, a uh, sorry, a kind of a program, a visual programming language that you could use in K to 12 schools, and it's really good for teaching logic. It's really good for t uh, telling stories. It's called Scratch. So if you Googled Scratch MIT, you could learn it. You could, um, you could find it. You could download it. It's totally free. So. What, did I, what I wanted to do was teach this to my undergrads, or at least help them understand it a bit more, but I wanted to find out more. So I went to YouTube, that was the first place I went. I typed in, what did I type in? MIT Scratch Tutorials. <clears throat> 10 year olds teaching me everything I needed to know, honestly, or eight year olds they could be, but these are the kids that are teaching me so I can go in and prepare my undergraduate students. And that sounds totally crazy, but it worked so well. These kids, are doing all sorts of things, posting it to YouTube. These are our content creators. And now this is kind of a fun tool, but when this is happening, it's absolutely crazy in some ways in terms of what we're actually doing. Um, the other piece I wanted to show you is, okay, so we're so worried about copyleft and Creative Commons and all of these other types of things and what, what, uh, what is new, new knowledge, for instance. Uh, this is another person named Ishmael Kudamit. He put out nine tracks on YouTube. What he did was kind of defied sort of the whole fair use thing, because he's in the States. Oh, yes, well, he's ex well, it would be fair use, sorry. Um, he took pieces from YouTube. So the, 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 the symphony that you saw before was very deliberate. The person asked for people to kind of submit. But this guy did it sort of the reverse. He found stuff on YouTube, found clips on YouTube to create something brand new. And so this, in terms of a metaphor for creativity, taking all of these pieces and fitting it to your own uses, this is sort of like the papers we do in some ways, but much more beautiful in some ways. So he took off pieces from, took pieces from YouTube, put them together to create this virtual band, and I'll show you what it actually looks like. So none of these people knew each other. It's all just put together after the fact, as he found these things. think about you know, creativity in that particular sense, and when we take little pieces, they're not really ours, but when you create something totally yours, that, that's totally different than what you actually expected, it, it's, it's really kind of neat, and, and it really need exercise in, in copyright and fair use. Um, another thing, so, so far I've talked about free tools, open content, and next the big thing, obviously, is open access. Um, the, the idea of open access, I don't know if you've, you are open access publishers, we actually just launched a, an open access journal, which uh, far exceeded what we've done in print. We had like 50 or 100 uh, subscription, paper subscriptions before, now we're getting tens of thousands of hits since we've launched it only four or five months ago. And we're, we're starting to see what open access and being digital and being online makes 
you know, why do we publish in the first place? And so the idea of open access is not to negate peer review or to get rid of peer review, but to make published work research still peer reviewed, uh, still credible, but online to more, uh, to, to more people, accessible to anyone. Uh, Erodola from Athabasca is probably one of the ones that I, you, know, you can look at if you're looking for research in this particular field. But it's not just about open access journals, or also if you're looking for other ones, you may want to look at the directory of open access journals for a list of, I think, four or 5,000 open access journals that are available now. Um, but the idea of open access uh, courses, for instance, courses that you can uh, attend, or open access PD uh, possibilities. I mean, this is something that uh, two people in the room actually ran, the AACE social media seminar. If you wanted to know more about social media, this was a great seminar that we saw, I don't know, 100, 200 people attend virtually, and this was a totally free so seminar that you could actually attend uh, online, obviously, from your office. Uh, you could watch the recordings later. Uh, college 2.0 is just this informal group of college professors that come together and learn from each other. This is not institutionally mandated. Just someone set up a Ning, and there's hundreds and hundreds of different professors who are learning from each other, sometimes about e-learning, sometimes about technology, and sometimes just about pedagogy, all forms of pedagogy. Uh, every Tuesday night on Twitter, there's something called EdChat. People use a single hashtag to have conversations about education. All of these chats are archived. There are so many different ways to learn as a professional online. This is sort of the idea of nearly now. It's not synchronous, it's not asynchronous, but it's almost nearly now. It's almost totally responsive. People are doing this from their cell phones, from their desktop computers, from their mobile, for just about anything. And this is available to you. And so how do we rethink how we do PD in academia? The other idea, of course, uh, the idea of ubiquity, that we have these particular tools that, again, as I mentioned before, that mobile is going to uh, interrupt in some ways to move beyond desktop access by 2013, 2014, that we'll have more of these. And the, the question that George raised earlier, like who provides the, the interface to, to students? Who brings it in? Do we do one-to-one? -one, or do we acknowledge all of those devices that they have and try to teach in, in new ways and to um, uh, counter students that particular way? So, uh, sorry, uh, two particular ones there, uh, laptop for child. Uh, in Uruguay, there's, there's something called the, o, the One Laptop Per Child Project, OLPC, which has been quite good in looking at developing nations in terms of one-to-one uh, uh, -one access. Uh, and recently, fast internet access becomes a legal right in Finland. Thinking about that and what we actually have access to uh, in Saskatchewan, I mean, we've been pushing that idea, but still in rural areas, we don't have fast internet access. And this needs to be a right for us, I believe. Um, and then if you want to catch up more on what's coming down the pipe, a good place to start would be the 2010 Horizon Report, which kind of looks at the trends, and certainly the one that's uh, highlighted there is, is mobile computing, something to look at in the next year. And then there are other ones you may want to look at. Uh, also, open content is one that uh, is highlighted for the year, uh, year ahead. But I want to talk about this personalization because you've got enough of my personalization. Well, you'll get a bit more here. But I think this is an incredibly important piece for all of this. Um, this sort of idea of the connected reality. Oh, sorry. I'm going to go back. Connected reality. This is a, this is a, 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 a commercial from Sprint, Palm Pre. And certainly it's got that, uh, that kind of tinge of technological determinism in it, certainly, if you watch it. But this is sort of where we're headed in some ways. Welcome to the Now Network. Population 49 million. Right now, 23 million cell phone calls are being made. 380,000 people just hung up. One million emails are in run. Seven percent of them contain the words "miracle banana diet." They're hitting 63,000 spam filters now. Twice as many people are searching the word "dog" on Google versus "cat." Tiny, the talking boxer, is being uploaded to YouTube from someone's phone now. Two million people are sending a text message during a business meeting. Most popular subject: diapers. 233,000 people just cleared on Twitter. 26 percent of viewing this have no idea what that means. 6,000 people are researching restaurants in a cab. 29 of them just left their phone in that same cab. 13,000 people just landed and are switching on their phones. This is what's happening now. America's most compatible 3G network. Bringing you the first wireless 4G network. You don't need to advertise, but um, some quick stats. I'm not going to read those all to you, but the one, you know, you could look at one of those. Four billion images on Flickr. Those are often personal images, somewhat 
sometimes semi-professional, but a, a ton of those uh, that you can be using in the classroom are totally copyleft. Everything I put up is, is copyleft. Things that you can use in your presentations, most of those things that you see, this, the, the images in this particular uh, PowerPoint, you notice I use a lot of images, all from, from Flickr, almost, all, uh, almost exclusively. But looking at those stats, the stat I really like, YouTube is huge, 24 hours of video now uploaded every minute. Even if one hour of those is good. I mean, that's just an immense amount of information to think that every single minute, 24 hours of video is uploaded. And to think of how can this even be possible in some ways. It just absolutely blows your mind. Um, and of course, we continue in K-12 schools to, to block YouTube in, in a lot of cases. I don't know what the policies are, but in a lot of cases, it becomes a bandwidth issue. It becomes a content issue. I think the worst part of YouTube, most people agree, is the comments. I mean, the, the worst part of society comes up in the comments in some cases. Um, but, it, but it's quite interesting. But the, the wealth of information, much of this stuff is very, very good. Um, so, sorry, a little bit. Uh, it doesn't show up the same on the screen. Um, a little McLuhan-esque here. Every, each technology creates a new environment. The effects of media come from their form, not their content. And that kind of goes back to the idea that we often block content, but we're forgetting really the point of having the pipe in itself. That what's sometimes more, what's more important to us is actually understanding what the pipe does to us. Having that access to human knowledge versus the human knowledge itself, I think, is incredibly important to think about. Um, oops, sorry. Some of you may have seen this. Oh, I'm going to go back for a second. Kind of weird how it's showing up. Um, how many people have seen this shot before? Okay, this is Obama in Berlin. This is actually, first time I saw this was you streamed. I was watching a conference um, from far away, and someone used this particular image. And just to look how connected people are, just absolutely amazing. And, and so I thought about, you know, what are those people doing in that particular image? You know, what are they, what are, where are they sending it? A lot of people may be sending something to Facebook, to YouTube. They're personalizing that particular experience. And you wonder with a lot of media coverage that would have been in the German press at the time, that why are people all doing this? Certainly, you know, a lot of them to say that I was there, this is the closest I got, but we're really looking at personalizing messages. And I want to take that a little bit further. Okay, so I saw this sign. My four-year-old had a dance recital, her first dance recital. And I saw this very oppressive sign on the, on the door because it was in, you know, oppressive because it was sort of Comic Sans and clip art, you know, you know the, the, that sort of thing. It just, and the filming, right? I don't know, I don't remember the last time or if I've ever used film. Um, filming of the dance performance is prohibited, yet I still had this thing in my pocket, this little flip digital camera that you can buy for $168, $168 bucks. had that with me, and I knew the spirit of uh, of the sign. I know what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to buy the $60 DVD that they gouged me for. So I did that. But I also did this. Okay, so here I am, <laughs> right, breaking the law or something or some sort of terms of service or something, and there's my daughter, all right? I was banned from watching this uh, or from videotaping it, from personalizing it for myself. Okay, and just, all right, the head's in the way, right? And if you listen really closely, you can hear my wife sort of chuckle. Maybe not. <laughs> this is forbidden. You shouldn't be watching. It shouldn't have happened, right? <laughs> anyway, I killed the whole little thing. But it's much longer. But I, I, I have watched the $60 version. And we have five kids on the stage, and that's wedged between like tons of other dances that I just don't care about because I don't know any other kid but my daughter in that one particular song. I personalized that experience very much for me and it was incredibly important that I caught that and that I could ca catch my wife talking about it and laughing and that sort of thing. And that's why personalization to me is so important. That's my personalized reason for this, I guess, in some ways. And we often do some really kind of neat things in, in institutions, whether it's web pages or not, but we can only get so far in the institutions that we look at. And I'm, I'm using the example of web pages. Most people who have been on web page committees, the thing that we do, and I think that we do pretty well, is we try to personalize it as much as we possibly can. So you run in, you know, for faculty, for students, for prospective students, for grad students, and so on. This is actually, uh, I can't, I'm not going to show it, or maybe, no, it's going to take too long to load. This is like a flash animation, basically from Concordia College from Minnesota. And if you click on a person, they take you on a little personal tour, and it's kind of cool, it's kind of fun. Uh, and they show you around the campus, which I think is kind of cool for campus and so on. But 
in reality, when we start looking at this as being sort of a tool, is it more than this? Is personalization what we do at the university? I'm not talking about web pages anymore. I'm talking about what we do for students, giving them a certain degree of choice within the structures that we have. Is it any different than The Cave of Time, which was one of my favorite choose your own adventure book? that I hated having only a finite number of choices. I still remember reading these and putting my fingers in. Uh, you know, I couldn't deal with having too many choices, right? And I wanted to see which of my choices were better, and they never seemed to make sense because they weren't like morally based or something. I don't know. I needed to have some sort of way of knowing what my next choice would be, and that really bothered me as a kid. Um, anyway, but, and, but is it any better than that? Um, so when we started looking at this coming into our schools, when we start seeing this in front of us more and more every semester, you probably tracked it in your mind when you see a couple of laptops and a few more laptops. And you may not even teach in a, in a room like that, but when you start seeing that and we're not personalizing the experience for them, what are we doing? And, and that's really an important piece. If everyone in this room is doing exactly the same thing, just in, on a different machine, is that enough? And I think that's really important to start thinking about how we personalize the the, uh, the, the um, the, the learning of others, and how we do that within an institution or outside of an institution. So I want to talk a little bit about community, and that's a term that we use a lot. Um, I'm going to use a picture of uh, something very personal to me. Just back to this personal stuff. I told you, it's just family pictures. That's all I'm doing. Um, this is my dad right here. So if it was Facebook right now, this is Pier 21, not too far from here. I've never been there, and someday, hopefully, I will. I'm so close, but so far. Um, and someone wrote on that, unfortunately, in red pen. Um, but when I scanned it, it's still there. Um, to look at this and to think about social affordance again and to think about why this might be important. Today, we can, you know, if you put any photograph up on Flickr, kids attack it. Like if we took a section photo of, or a classroom photo or a course photo and someone from a, a group on Facebook or, or puts it up on Facebook, you see it just emerge. Like people bas basically put their tags and tag each other on, on it and so on. And this, of course, I could go and find out who else was on the boat and that sort of thing. This is actually taken from Pier 21 archives. I could find out who else was on the boat, but without that, all of these rich stories of who is who, my dad's actually on Facebook, and really on Facebook, I have this tag, and it links to him, and it shows who his kids are, and then you could fall, if there was some level of, you know, no, no privacy, if I guess if, if there's a removal of privacy, or if you're his friend, you could follow and see uh, his children and so on. And there's some rich stories told, but without these social affordances, we kind of miss out on that. Um, so when I develop a rich community, which I think is what I developed on Twitter, I can do things like this. It's a healthy baby girl, seven pounds, four ounces, I can do that. And then I can get a number of responses from people who I've built professional and personal relationships with in a number of ways. And some of you may feel uncomfortable with that sort of thing, those sorts of announcements, but that's understandable. Not everyone is as open in terms of this as others are. But it's also kind of neat when someone who you barely know from Florida develops a group card and you know, gives you 100 or 200 plus signatures with pictures of goodwill towards towards your daughter and that sort of thing. When we start building these expanded communities from people around the world, scary to some, but a reality for others in some ways. And in some ways, this can be very neat in terms of what we do, and especially if they're all educators. We start to see how many educators are connected in these particular ways. Now, there's a lot of fear around connecting in these ways. Certainly, Dana Boyd is probably one of the best scholars around looking at digital, citizen digital citizenship, what teens and tweens are doing in their bedrooms and, and et cetera around Facebook and social networks. But one of the things that comes out strongly in her work is the idea that teens are not connecting in the ways that we fear. The ways that we fear that they're doing all these really bad things and being totally, um, you know, careless with their privacy is not really happening. We're actually seeing more adults be more careless with their privacy than teens. They're a bit more aware of this in a lot of cases. But she does tell us about some of the things that are really important to understand. Properties like persistence. When you put something online, it's going to be there forever. If it's, it can be replicable, it can be searchable, it can be scalable, and you have to worry about being able to delocate your location when you tweet something, for instance, if you're worried about that information. But think about scalability. Just one example. Uh, take the example of the Winnipeg teachers, who you may have heard who are lap dancing in the gymnasium. Anyone hear that? Right? Scalable. <laughs> uh, persistent. Right? Ten years ago, you would have not seen this grow as big as you can, but when you introduce YouTube, when you introduce that kid with the camera in the corner on, his, on her cell phone or 
that sort of thing, that changes everything. These are the properties that we have to think about, but they're also great affordances. But we have to be worried about these things in the classroom. So a good way of seeing this, the student in your class can't show up, but they want to use stream it from their phone to the student, you know, to, from a friend, et cetera. So you can actually use stream it. This is being live streamed to a number of people. I don't know who's out there. All sorts of neat things around that, but that video, visible audience piece is a bit interesting as well as a, as a professor. Uh, Michael Wesh also lo looks at uh, YouTube communities. If you haven't seen Michael Wesh's stuff, you really should. All over YouTube, he's got tons of keynotes and presentations that are really, really uh, accessible and very good, insightful and so on. But he talks about uh, YouTube communities, the idea of connection without constraint, that we actually find very tremendously deep YouTube, uh, communities forming in YouTube. He uses examples like the Free Hugs guy. Have you ever seen Free Hugs? So the guy that, you know, the hippie guy that's holding the sign up and people come up and hug him, which is like, if you look at that, I saw a person in our university center where everyone eats and so on holding it up and no one would go near this person. Like, it is a bit scary, but to get over that social convention that you would show affection to a total stranger is something that's kind of strange. Also use the example of uh, Mad V, a person who basically held his hand up to a webcam and typed, you know, basically wrote One World and all these other people uh, did video kind of reactions and did what was really important to them. He compiled these together and made a very powerful video. And so this type of humanity actually exists on YouTube. I see the humanity in social networks that you'd never expect. Uh, I thought this was kind of neat. Uh, this was a, a plea from someone on a community called Reddit, help fix the last picture of my mom. His mother died the night before that he posted this uh, from cancer. The last photo that he had was this. And you can see the cannula, uh, and he wanted to remove that. So he's basically asking the network, is there a way that you can remove this? So people easily, you know, quick, quickly did that. There's a lot of Photoshop kind of geek people out there that can do this, and there was all sort of enhancements, and there was a number of copies made, which, I mean, okay, so that's, it's, it's really nice. Maybe that's not like a community thing, but what happened under that post was really cool. People talked about loss, people talked about cancer, and, and people that they lost, and, and those sort of things. And reading that, just, you can kind of disregard some of all the really bad stuff that happens on YouTube when you start to see the humanity that comes out in an act like that. And it's really kind of cool. And I kind of almost like, it gets me emotional to see that sort of stuff, you can tell. Um, so in practice, and I'm showing you K-12 examples, and there's a reason I'm doing that. I can show you tons of uh, university examples, but I want you to see what, what teachers are doing every day. First of all, a lot of teachers that I'm teaching are really one of the first things I'd look at is the idea of building a professional and personal learning network, being the center of these tools, understanding the tools and the content exist, and making these, uh, you know, making these sort of connections, because they'll be able to do this with their students in a number of ways. And that is a really kind of a neat, rich learning environment. And I'm doing this with my graduate students so that they become adept in these network connections and understand that if I don't know the answers as a professor, I can, I can sort of send out the question to other experts around the world that I'm connected to or that they will be connected to. If they need to learn about Kansas for some reason, they can find a really good teacher in some classroom in Kansas and connect their students with them by making these safe and personal uh, connections. So I have a teacher 45 mi uh, minutes down the road, uh, Kathy Casty, she's award-winning, she's doing some amazing things, but what she does, if she wants to talk about rocks to her grade one, she brings in a geologist, so she has someone Skype in to talk about rocks. Or if her students are doing things like uh, hatching pheasant eggs, they put that up and they use stream it out from their, from their world, so the whole world can see the learning of these kids and how the kids document their learning. This is stuff we should be doing in university in some cases, like to open up what's happening in our classes. Um, grade five, I'm not gonna actually show you the video, but I could, it's just, it's wonderful. These are grade five kids from public school, or yeah, public school 22, public school division 22 uh, in New York. Kids that would qualify for sort of a free lunch program, I mean, low socioeconomic, socioeconomic status. Um, you can find all of their work at ps22chorus.blogspot.com. Um, really kind of neat, I think last week they met with like Queen Latifah and had this really cool sing-off. This particular song, which I won't show you, they're singing Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. Uh, Stevie Nicks actually watched the video, uh, made a response to them and said, will you come and sing with us in New York City with, with Fleetwood Mac just recently? I mean, these are the kind of experiences through network connections that kids are having 
These are the exceptional experiences that a grade five group can have. And how are they, you know, they're going to be changed forever by these particular experiences. And we can provide these with our kids. Kids who do not have exceptional experiences, we can provide that with them. Um, you know, a, a teacher I worked with this summer has a YouTube channel. It's something simple. You know, a lot of schools still ban YouTube. But, you know, uh, taking all of her student work, presentations, reactions, animations, all sorts of things, and creating a channel for the best of her student work. And this is the sort of things that are happening. Uh, a grade 10 TEDx project. You know, don't have the right uh, textbooks, but you happen to have computers, or you want to have some up-to-date information. This is Christian Long from uh, Texas, who basically had, there's, I think, 640-ish TEDx talks, or there may be more, I may be off with the number. I think it actually says up there, but there's quite you know, hundreds of different TEDx talks, which are really high-level thinking talks. So these grade tens have to watch these, inventory them, value them, give evaluations, etc., rate them, and so on, using all of this really good available web content, you know, that's out there for these kids. Um, this same uh, teacher, I thought this was kind of neat. He actually tweeted this. The TEDx project has confirmed it. I'm no longer an English teacher. Instead, I'm an agent, social media DJ, and publisher for my kids, which I think is really some really cool, strong metaphors for what the teacher does in the classroom. So how do we extend that into higher ed? You know, how do we do that? How do we reshape what we do, mostly as contact experts in a lot of cases, uh, to really inspire and to motivate students in different ways? Um, certainly, one of the things that we have been doing is the idea of open courses. Uh, I won't speak about the other two, but a course I teach at the uh, U of R. Um, does that mean my time's up or something? I'm pretty close anyway. Um, sorry. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> One of the teachers, courses I teach at the U of R is an open graduate course. 20 registered students, which is the cap of what we actually use. Um, but I've actually had over 200 people participate in the course for free which only these students actually just augment the, the experience for others. And we've had people from around the world attend this particular course. So if one person connect 200 other students, qualified students in a lot of ways, to a particular course to open it for free, but also enhance the learning of all of your other students by giving and also giving away content and an experience, it's kind of neat. So there's a number of things that you can actually do. We could talk about those more. So, uh, your president, I don't see him anymore, <laughs> mentioned that we're not going to change just for the sake of change. I think this is probably the worst reason you'd ever say, we're going to do this, because it's not going to go away. It's going to persist, and it's going to bug us. We've got to deal with it at some point. But it's true. It's not going to go away. I don't think there's a point where we're going to be less connected, that social networks would die. Social networks have always existed, but we've never had the means to visualize them and to connect in the ways we had. Um, I do believe social media provide engagement, motivation. I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, incredible possibilities for teaching and learning. I've shared a bit of those. Um, development of meaningful learning communities, which I think we often use the term community, but we don't do it well in a lot of cases, and we don't understand it in a lot of cases because the term has changed in a lot of cases. And I believe that geography has become nearly irrelevant, that we can attract a different population. We can engage with a different population that are, not geograph that are geographically dispersed in many different ways. And I think that's one of the important things. So as my, as my girl sort of looks on to her school next year, to her grade one school, I believe that we should have a lot of really important walls. There's a lot of walls and a lot of boundaries that we do have. And I'm kind of being softer on this subject than sometimes. But I believe that we need to blow out some of the walls that we have, some of the boundaries that we have in education. Um, I mean, if we think of the assumptions, um, just, I mean, I'll, I'll use the, the example of an open journal, for instance, because this is something that I just helped develop. But all of the things that we do within the journal, creating a journal, holding back articles. So we, we always think that we have to get so many articles to create an issue, for instance. That's one of the things that we, you know, we have in the background that we actually have to kind of rethink. Or we have to have a certain length of paper and so on. And I'm not saying this is stuff that we should change, but we have a lot of assumptions about what we do, and perhaps we don't often know the reasons that we do these particular things. And I think the same thing happens with grade levels and all sorts of other things. But anyway, I'll leave it at there, sort of kind of the gaze in the distance, and I'll hopefully some, engage some questions here. So thanks for listening to my uh, kind of somewhat enthusiastic uh, rang of ram ramble anyway, so thank you.